So we've been charged with talking about secrecy in the Manhattan Project, which is uh, both something that runs through every single other topic we have here, but is also a sort of historical site of interest in and of itself. So it's a context and a thing. And the way we were going to divide this up was I'm going to talk about it like a historian, and, and Mac is going to talk about it like a museum person, because it turns out we just look at the world a completely different way. Um, <laughs> So what I want to do is try to frame what I'm calling the practices, narratives, and questions, and I'll try to explain what that is. This image, though, by the way, you may or may not have seen it. You probably recognize the subtitle there. That's the, uh, the, the title of the Smythe Report. The Smythe Report was originally supposed to be called Atomic Bombs, but Groves was so afraid of the, sec the, sec the secrecy breaking that he made them only apply it with a red stamp just before release, and, it, and he forgot to do it. And so the only copy that has the red stamp on it is the one they sent to the Library of Congress for the copyright registration, which is that copy there. Um, so the secrecy has warped even the title of our understanding of the bomb uh, in a very direct way. I think you have the little thing there. Oh, okay, we'll see if this works. I'm, I'm not running it off of PowerPoint, really. I'm doing a PDF, so hopefully it works. Okay, so I, first thing I want to do is just do a brief historical chronology, make sure we're all on the same page, and just highlight a few things about the history of Manhattan Project secrecy that, that I, 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 I think are not extremely well known. I say this as a guy who's finishing a book on the history of secrecy uh, in the Manhattan Project through the present. So some of these things will be known. Some of these things are, I think, somewhat obscure points. But just to quickly go over a few things. Um, the secrecy, as most people know, starts in early 1939. Uh, Leo Szilard urges self-censorship. This doesn't really work. Um, but one thing that I think is often not appreciated is that his self-censorship regime becomes the first institutional bodies uh, that become interested in uranium work and uh, start reviewing physics papers. Uh, and it starts to verge from self-censorship to externally imposed censorship, even before the military is involved and things like that. That's the same thing that Szilard is doing early on. Um, fall of 1939, FDR says, go ahead, start working on uranium, and do it secretly. From the very beginning, FDR is the one who is mandating the secrecy. Um, and that's an interesting and, and, and curious point. 1940, 1941, uh, not a lot happens with the bomb, as you know. Uh, it's a very exploratory program. They call it the Uranium Committee. The fact that they call it the Uranium Committee is a sign that they, they don't have a lot of secrecy yet. Um, <laughs> it's secret, but not super secret. And you can see this in 1942 when Bush, Conan, and, and the other uh, uh, people who sort of take over the project have sort of a coup of it, uh, uh, it becomes much more secret immediately and they rename it the S1 committee. And that's one of their first things they do is say, let's stop saying the word uranium so loudly. FDR tells them that what he requires is what he calls absolute secrecy. That is, even at the time in 1942, and FDR is not thinking necessarily about the bomb as a wonder weapon at this time. They've told FDR it's only going to be maybe 2,000 tons of TNT, which is big, but it's not, you know, these these world destroying sort of uh, 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 proportions. He says still, don't tell anybody about it. The fact that we're even having a secret about it is itself a secret. And one thing I've tried to play with in my work is, well, why is FDR saying this? He's making it more secret than radar. He's making it more secret than other secret projects and is very explicit about this. And uh, one of the reasons is because he's afraid of Congress. He, he's afraid it will be seen as a boondoggle. It's not necessarily just the Germans and the Japanese and all that. There's all sorts of domestic concerns for the secrecy. FDR is very aware, and Bush and Conan encourage him in this as, as well, that uh, this is not the sort of thing that anybody's going to approve spending a lot of money on. It sounds totally science fiction uh, still at this point. 1943, the Army takes over General Groves, hooray. Um, General Groves ups all the secrecy uh, that they already had in place. So a lot of the secrecy that we associate with the Manhattan Project, like isolated sites or having compartmentalization, uh, censorship of scientific publications, the civilians have already started doing that by 42. Uh, 43, it all gets amplified to, to very high levels. All right. Spring 45, the interim committee, uh, they start realizing we're going to start using a bomb. We might want to think about what's going to happen after we use the bomb. They craft what they call the publicity strategy. And the idea is they will give information out so that information doesn't leak out. And this is where the Smythe Report comes from. The first official history of the bomb was released um, only uh, uh, three or four days after Nagasaki. Um, and he also creates what he calls the Manhattan Project Public Relations Organization, which sounds pretty amusing and benign after the fact. Uh, the idea behind this whole strategy is, and Groves is completely on board with this, 
we can't hold back the information just by censorship, especially in a post-war regime, the newspapers won't listen to us. What we need to do is give them information, sanitized information, and then attach to it a, a writer that says, P.S., if you go beyond this, we'll throw you in jail. And that's the sort of method. And I always find that very interesting that there's secrecy through disclosure. That's a very important early bit, and it continues through the Atomic Energy Commission. It's, it's not just complete silence. They know they can't do that and also still use a bomb, because the fact is, once you blow up a city with a bomb, everybody's going to know you were making a bomb. August 45, after the bomb is, is used, Truman continues to urge secrecy. This is actually unusual. So there's actually an ex executive order done before the end of World War II, before the bomb is used, where Truman says, at the end of the war, everything that's secret and scientific should be released for public knowledge. All this great science and technology we've acquired. And people actually go to Groves right afterwards and say, so is the bomb count under that? And Groves says no. And he actually gets Marshall and, and these higher people to exempt the bomb, whereas lots of radar is getting declassified, lots of all these other you know scientific projects they do. The bomb is treated as a special secret thing for the short term. November 45, uh, Groves was under the belief that he, he could push through legislation. He wouldn't have to worry about the long-term secrecy policy. That would be something for Congress. It doesn't work out. Uh, May Johnson Act fails. This is the Army legislation. Um, Groves, interestingly, unilaterally sets up the first declassification organization as a short-term thing. And that's not something we normally associate with Groves. Uh, the guidelines for declassification were not developed by the military. They were not developed by bureaucrats. They were developed by a team of scientists uh, chaired by Richard Tolman. The other people on the, on the team are Robert Oppenheimer, Ernest Lawrence, Arthur Compton, Harold Uri, Frank Spedding. Uh, it's sort of the top A-list of the Manhattan Project. Come up with the first attempt to come up in the entire federal government, as far as I know, with guidelines for how you sift out what is dangerous and what is not dangerous. And, and what do you raise in favor of something being released, a scientific fact, what do you rate against it, what things of the Manhattan Project go into categories. They have three categories. One is release it immediately. One is never release it ever. They put the hydrogen bomb in that category. And then in the middle, they have a release it depending on how the circumstances change in the next five years. So kind of an interesting thing. That's very early on, November 1945. <laughs> Same time, uh, the McMahon Act is proposed. The initial version of the McMahon Act uh, is, is very pro-scientist. It has no secrecy of basic scientific information, very limited secrecy for what they call related technical information of how you actually make bombs. Uh, it's, it's a very liberal bill. The only section on information is, is titled Dissemination of Information. Uh, February 1946, as a result of this, Groves leaks the Gizenko affair to the press. Pretty good evidence that Groves himself is the one who leaked it. Uh, there's a huge furor over Soviet spying in Canada, even though this is actually rather incidental spying as far as spying goes. Uh, and it's part of this trying to put real secrecy requirements in place. March 1946, Oppenheimer is involved in the atchison Lilienthal report. This is the international control. The early drafts of this report are explicit in that they are not about using secrecy. And they actually say in there, this is not a plan of using ignorance as a means of controlling the bomb. It will not work. We will only do it by focusing on material things, so materi uh, uranium mines and facilities for enriching them, things like that. That gets edited just before the release of it. They remove the explicit anti-secrecy, though it's implicitly in there. Uh, this is part of sort of a rear guard attempt to get rid of secrecy. Uh, May 1946, the McMahon Act is, is modified in secret committee. That section that was called dissemination of information is renamed the control of information. And they add a clause which says that all information about making nuclear weapons or nuclear energy is, born, is basically uh, considered born secret until uh, explicitly declassified. So this is sort of the extreme opposite, where if I'm a physicist working at a university and I happen to come across new ways of making bombs, it's classified even though I don't work for the government even though there's no censor. I don't, I'm not at Los Alamos, there's no fences. And then 1947, the Atomic Energy Commission takes on that, and they also adopt all those previous Manhattan Project security policies. So all those declassification policies, all the ways of dealing with uh, clearances, things like that, are pretty much just adopted wholesale by the AEC. Uh, and these policies and practices uh, start to spread to all other parts of the federal government. Now we're getting into sort of the other thing. 1950, Klaus Fuchs is revealed to be a spy, and we get a whole other discussion about secrecy. The, the secrecy discussion changes from, my god, General Groves is so great at keeping things secrets, to, my god, they have all the secrets. Um, it was a total failure. Uh, so this is Greenglass, the Rosenbergs, all that stuff comes out then. 
1954, we also have the Oppenheimer security hearing. Uh, this is now the, the, the really perverse side of secrecy is coming up and part of the, the, the discussion, uh, secrecy is the destroyer of lives, destroyer of careers. Now just to move into beyond, I put this in there not because it's Manhattan Project history, but this is the sort of thing we're dealing with today if we're going to talk about secrecy. Um, 1950s and 60s, you have a whole debate over fallout, limited test ban treaty. We talked about that a little bit today. We have a lot of distrust of radiation, a lot of distrust of nuclear weapons, a lot of distrust of the government. 1970s, you have the nuclear power debate. You have the nuclear waste debate start. Uh, you have nuclear terrorism starts being discussed around 1972 after the Munich uh, 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 Olympics. Um, you have people arguing what, what, what's known as the safeguards debate, that there's too much fissile material unsecured in the world, and a, an amateur, a group of amateurs could make nuclear weapons and blow them up. There are no more secrets anymore as part of that debate. 1970s, you also have the Pentagon Papers, Watergate, and the Church Committee. Church Committee is the CIA, Family Jewels, all that awful assassination stuff. Um, this isn't atomic at all, but it's a part of a general uh, uh, cynicism about secrecy, a, a rejection of secrecy, sort of comes to a peak around the Nixon era. You have the Star Wars debate in the 80s, very, you know, vociferous, lots of, you know, you guys lived through it. I was just a kid. Um, <laughs> late 1980s, early 1990s, the end of the Cold War, you get a very strong revisionist streak. We start seeing the Manhattan Project and the Cold War as sort of being a big folly, a big accident, not to, not to use your term, uh, uh, Richard. Uh, 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 but but this, this becomes a changing of the way we talk about it. 1990s, we have Wen Ho Lee, which becomes sort of Oppenheimer Part Two, And now we have the War on Terror 2001. We have an expanding secrecy regime. Uh, we, we have millions of people who have secrecy clearance in the United States. Uh, this is the context in which we are talking about secrecy. There are multiple things going on here beyond just what General Groves was doing that are going to resonate in people's brains. Um, I want to also just address what we mean by secrecy, what maybe I mean by secrecy. Uh, this is one of these terms that everybody uses very commonly, but is very rarely pinned down. Like democracy is another great example of this, where everybody has their own idea about it, freedom. Um, I find this very instructive. It's from the Latin Cicerno. I don't know how to speak Latin, so that's just a guess. Uh, it's the Latin root of the word secrecy and secret is to separate, to part, to sunder, to distinguish, to set aside. It's an act of division. Um, it's the act of dividing up the world. You separate out things like knowledge or people or places from the rest. You decide who gets to know it and who does not get to know it. And I find this a very useful way of thinking about it. It's this division. It's not one single thing. When we talk about secrecy in the Manhattan Project, it's a, it's a cluster of practices. The goal is to enact this division so that we have this knowledge. There is an atomic bomb and we are building one. It is feasible. Uh, uh, we want the practices that will let us divide that fact from 90% of the world, especially you know German and, uh, Germany and Japan. I just want to give an example of what I mean by practices. We've all seen secrecy stamps. They're, they are practically ubiquitous in our culture, this icono iconography of the stamp. The reason we have the stamp is not just to be scary and fun. It is part of an entire set of practices, uh, a secrecy regime, if you will. I stamp this paper, and that tells anybody else who looks at this paper what they have to do with it. It tells them who can see it. So it says you have to have a badge, you have to have a clearance to get in there. So we've not only are we dividing this paper up from a paper that isn't stamped like that, we're dividing this person up now into the person who can look at a paper that isn't stamped secrecy. And it tells you what happens, uh, where, what you have to do to keep the paper safe. So in, if it's uh, top secret, you have to have a guard with a gun. It tells you how you have to destroy the paper if you're getting rid of it. That guy has what's a burn basket, which is just such a wonderfully low-tech approach to getting rid of things. Uh, that I, I really love the, that, that aspect of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it tells you what happens if you misuse something that's stamped like that. Uh, you go to jail or die. I mean, the original Atomic Energy Act uh, had the death penalty associated with the misuse or even like the misstapling of restricted data. Uh, they took that out after they made the death penalty unconstitutional and when they redid the constitutional death penalty they never added it back in so you can't actually die for restricted data except under the Espionage Act. So, you know, there you go. This is what I mean by these linked sets of practices. So we have the, the, the document segregation, which is the stamping. We have the marking of the document. We have the, the personnel investigations that are required to give you a clearance, which manifests in some way that you can show it to somebody with a gun, because he won't let you see it otherwise. You have 
very intricate regulations about where these can be kept. So at Princeton, when they wanted to have Robert Oppenheimer and John von Neumann and things uh, like that working there, they had to build a giant safe. It's a safe building, and they had to clear it with the Atomic Energy Commission, the dimensions of the safe, and is this actually secure? Could a Soviet spy get into the safe? And all of this is consistent with regulations about how you handle these things with the stamps on them. And then finally, you have to have laws that give teeth to all these threats, because if I just write secret on a piece of paper, which is what they did in the Civil War, which is what they did in, in many other pre-World War II eras. Uh, World War I is when they start getting very serious about secrecy in the United States. Uh, that it, it doesn't just mean that you're in trouble or you're, you've done a bad thing, that it has real consequences associated with it. So if we, and, and now we're back at the stamp again. Okay, so what are the practices of secrecy in the Manhattan Project regime? I've listed a few, but there, there's a bunch of them, and I just want to give uh, a few illust uh, illustrative ones. Um, one, personal security investigations and clearances, so you're classifying people, who's good, who's bad, who's dodgy. Um, site isolation, you take critical facilities and you put them where nobody else lives because you feel that that makes people ask less questions. Uh, physical security, fences, guards, safes, all this is part of constructing a secrecy regime. Document control, these are the stamps on the document. There's actually a really great uh, file uh, from one of the one of the smaller outposts. Uh oh, I've gone, I've gone black. What did I do? Oh, I'm sorry, I made it I broke secrecy. <laughs> All right. Um, Whatever you did, we can't tell. They can't tell me. I, I've gone too far. I've said too much. Uh, I definitely said too much. But uh, I have a great letter from somebody who was at one of the outposts when the university is working on this, and he doesn't have a secrecy stamp, so he's having to write secret at the top of every paper he'd write, every page of his reports. And the last part, he says, "We need a stamp. Get me a stamp." And that that sort of again. The, it's about the practices, um, the guidelines of what you do with the document. You have code names, uh, you have purposeful obfuscation. Uh, you have indoctrination. You have what we call security consciousness, security culture. They call this OPSEC sometimes, operational security. It's convincing people how to think like people who care about secrecy. And this was a very early difficult problem with the Manhattan Project. It's one of the reasons Groves kind of isolated the University of Chicago uh, very early on, because uh, Arthur Compton did not have good security consciousness. Consciousness, and he was inviting people to colloquiums who were not yet cleared. And this was not acceptable. You know, he did not feel that this was an appropriate approach. And so he said, okay, you can do that, but you don't get to learn anything about making a bomb. Uh, compartmentalization, so one guy doesn't know what the other guy is working on, even though they're both in the same project. You have this at an extreme level at the production sites where the, you know, as we know, the people at uh, Oak Ridge and Hanford have no idea what they're doing whatsoever. Uh, many of them. You have censorship of media, of newspapers. This is voluntary in World War II, but they do try to do it with limited success. Um, and you definitely have censorship of project personnel, where you're reading mail and not letting them talk to their loved ones and things like that. You do have disinformation, which is a, another part of the secrecy regime. They have uh, fake press releases they sent out after Trinity. It says an ammo dump blew up and nobody got hurt. Uh, they tried to plant rumors at Los Alamos, totally failed. Um, and then they occasionally would do false denial. So at one point, it was it was when, when this news of the, the Norwegian, the attack on the Norwegian heavy water plant sort of got out in the world and people were saying, oh, maybe this has something to do with, oh, we heard about atomic energy. They got Harold Uri, the guy who discovered heavy, uh, heavy water, to write a letter to the editor saying, I don't have any clue what this is about. There's certainly no way to use this in war, which is a total lie, and you know, I wonder how he <laughs> felt about that. Um, you had a black budget, so this is one of the first big black budgets is the Manhattan Project, where they purposely, Roosevelt initially pays this out of a fund that has, gets no oversight. They eventually bring in a total of seven congressmen on the Manhattan Project to, to approve their budgetary requests as they start going up into the hundreds of millions. Um, and then lastly, they have legal teeth. They have the Espionage Act, they have intimidation. They have ways of saying, look, if you don't do what we say, really bad things can happen to you. And uh, this is all part of what, what, what backs it up. And now, these might, uh, there's more you can identify, but these are just a few major ones. This is what I mean by focusing on the practices. The other thing I want to just talk about is focusing on narratives. Uh, I want to give three examples of what I mean by narratives of secrecy. Uh, one, this, this is, there's the initial sort of the atomic bomb is the best kept secret of the war, a quote we've all probably seen here and there. That is a manufactured story written by Groves' public relations organization <laughs> right after World War II. And it was originally written to give thanks to the uh, Office of, uh, of Censorship for helping censor publications on it. And it just goes wild from there. And the basic story is it was necessary and it worked. The secrecy totally was successful. 
successful and that didn't appear in newspapers is totally false. I mean, there, there are newspaper stories about atomic energy. There are newspaper stories about, oh, the Germans are working on an atomic bomb. There's a really big one from a Cleveland newspaper that says, hey, there's this crazy lab out in Los Alamos and this guy named Oppenheimer is running it. And some people say they're making a huge explosion. And these things, you know, gave Grubbs palpitations, right? Uh, but it was not, it was not perfectly secret. And in fact, I argue, if you look at the numbers and the when the secrecy, when the leaks happen versus when the secrecy order is in place, the thing that lowers the number of stories about atomic energy and atomic bombs has nothing to do with the censorship order. It has to do with taking all of the atomic scientists and moving them to a reservation in New Mexico, <laughs> and they are no longer talking to the press. And that, it, when that happens, the number of, of, of mentions of atomic energy or uranium or all these things that they wanted out of the press drops to almost nothing, which is where it stays for the end of the war, with or without the censorship. So that's one narrative of secrecy. Secrecy, bold, important, worked. Here's another one. Robert Oppenheimer. Here's the guy who had all the secrets. Everybody trusted him. He was so good and the secrecy system came and, and hung him by it in the end. This is a, a very important legacy uh, narrative for the scientists since the Manhattan Project and in the Cold War. It's directly in competition with this first one. It also involves all these questions about espionage. It, it was Oppenheimer a risk more than some of the other people? Things like that. And then one last little narrative. Uh, surely you're joking, Mr. Fine. And we have Richard Feynman running around Los Alamos, poking holes in fences, doing uh, safe cracking, all this thing. And this is the secrecy of absurd narrative. The, the secrecy is something that bu narrow-minded bureaucrats do and that scientists, it gets in their way. And so if I were going to identify just a bunch of the narratives, we have one is the secrecy is impressive. Uh, we have secrecy is totalitarian. I don't mean this like fascism. I mean like it penetrates into all aspects of human lives. It controls your families. Uh, it controls what you can tell to your wives, uh, things of that nature. Those are all the secret side accounts. Max can talk about that a lot. Um, secrecy is absurd. So this is Feynman. You have a variation of this. Secrecy is absurdly totalitarian. That comes up a lot. The, the, it, is, it is everywhere and ridiculous. Um, secrecy is counterproductive. So this is Leo's a large charge after the war ended that secret we could have had the bomb even faster if there hadn't have been all this compartmentalization. Secrecy is ineffective. This is this is a very obvious one post Fuchs, right? You had all this Manhattan Project, the greatest secret ever kept, except that the Russians knew about it before Harry Truman did. Oops. Um, Secrecy is undemocratic. Uh, many of the revisionist accounts, and, and they're not incorrect in this, but but there's there's no democracy in the Manhattan Project. Uh, the, again, seven congressmen, and they weren't really asked. They were mostly told. It, it, this was there was not a lot of deliberation in any sort of deliberative government sense, except for the fact that you've said that the president can do all sorts of things in terms of war, and that's itself a democratic conundrum. And lastly, the secrecy is dangerous. And this is a very prominent in the late post-Cold War, uh, especially with regards to environmental and health concerns, corruption. We have a whole narrative of secrecy, especially in the 90s. We have the plutonium experiments revealed, uh, the human radiation experiments, uh, all these sorts of ways in which secrecy was abused. And this is a very potent way of talking about secrecy today, especially in the post-9-11 period when we have so much secrecy across the board. So what are the big challenges for talking about secrecy, in my opinion? One, how do we represent physically the control of knowledge and the culture of secrecy? Max can talk about this a bit. Secrecy is information control. My answer for this is focus on the practices, focus on the things. Uh, uh, not so much the big point. Those can come in there, but, but practices are the way to visualize this, I think. How do we intu intuitively illustrate the, phys the physically the way in which secrecy affected every aspect of the Manhattan Project, that it's not just well, it was all done within a fence, but every decision, every every project, the whole question of the decision to make the bomb was as warped by secrecy as is the question of how much radiation, uh, they, how much they knew about radiation before dropping the bombs in, uh, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, secrecy is at every level in this project. It affects how people talk about it. And then lastly, how do we balance the competing and contradictory narratives of secrecy? How do we not either make it all Richard Feynman, ha ha, secrecy is funny because I have safe cracking, but also not, oh, secrecy was important and we had to do it, but also not, uh, secrecy was an awful thing that ate people up and spit them out again. And lastly, how do we address the more long-term legacy? Uh, uh, some of this will be talked about tomorrow. We can talk about this here now. But uh, the fact that a lot of the practices of secrecy that we're talking about today within the war on terror, within the, 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 the expansive size of the, the, the military industrial complex, all these things, they are pioneered during the Manhattan Project, not just the actual procedures, but the mindsets, these fears of existential uh, threats, uh, the language of talking about it. Um, and that's all I was going to say. So why don't we turn to Mac now? Okay, well then, <clears throat> then we need to uh, 
convert to the to the next presentation. And okay, uh, there we are. What what I uh, want to address is is if you will assets that we have to talk about the idea of the secret city and just what were these places I'll stress Oak Ridge more than the other two but what what was it like in, in everyday life for the people who were working on these projects and these were people some of whom were actually in the in the uh, the production factories others were their families others were the people who were providing services to the residents of the secret cities so we we have a a, a rather interesting uh, kind of whoops uh, kind of uh, uh, culture that emerged as a result of this this uh, uh, Endeavor, and of course we've heard a lot about General Groves, and here he is, and uh, it was he who was was as we just heard imposing these these various strictures on what could and could not be done, said who could go where, when, how, and what was going to happen when they did it. Um, the first thing that that the uh, the secrecy involved was okay, where are we going to do it? And right now, I'm, as I said, I'm going to concentrate on Oak Ridge, Hanford, and Los Alamos. And, and uh, Groves put several requirements on the sites for these research and production facilities. Um, one, they want to be remote and in places where there aren't a whole lot of people anyway. Uh, they want to be inland so they're safe from attack, uh, lest a submarine come along to the shore and begin to... Uh, provide attacks, and they had to be in clement weather so that they could be working year-round. Uh, uh, sorry, Minnesota, sorry, Maine. Uh, these aren't places that we want to do uh, secret projects. And in Oak Ridge, in particular, uh, there are three plants going into Oak Ridge, and there needed to be natural barriers between the plants. So if we look at a, at a map, whoops, if we look at a map of Oak Ridge, what we see, the red dots there, I'm sorry that the scale here is not what I thought we were going to be dealing with, uh, are, are the plants in three separate mountain valleys. And the basic premise here is, well, if one of them blows up, it won't affect the other two. And if we, uh, and I just want to go back and uh, look at where these, these were geographically. I um, mean, here's Oak Ridge in eastern Tennessee. Here's Hanford up in Washington, and here's Los Alamos down in New Mexico. So they're they're widely scattered across the country. They're in remote locations in Oak Ridge. Uh, we've we've got three plants that that are are physically separated and therefore not, not able to damage one another. And here's a, a looking looking at Y12 at Oak Ridge, and we can see the mountain valley that that it, that it is placed in, such that if you go laterally with an explosion in any direction here, you're not going to affect. Uh, um, either either K or, or, or O with, with the uh, results of, of, of that explosion. Well, each of these sites had to develop significant kinds of, of, uh, of things. They had to do the activities associated with the Manhattan Project itself, and then it also had to provide residential and workforce resources for housing, how we're going to get around to the various facilities, and then, as, as Alex was suggesting, how we're going to control what happens as, as all of these go on. Well, the, the building the plants was an absolutely incredible industrial achievement. Here's K25 at its, at its peak. I, a absolutely astonishing building. I've had the good fortune of being in it. It's no longer, so none of you will have that opportunity again. But it was a mile long and 400 yards wide. And, and thousands of identical thermal diffusion units that were just beating the bejesus out of those uranium molecules in, in order to provide the materials that, that were adequate for, for making the bombs. But the construction that was, uh, was, was produced over a very short period of time was truly amazing. But then, simultaneously, there had to be housing and services for the people doing the construction. So there were instant cities that, that, emer that, that came up. Richland, Washington on the right, early picture of Oak Ridge on the left, various kinds of housing, and there were some interesting decisions made on who got to live in what kind of a house. 
And uh, as, as you might imagine, if you were higher ranked, uh, you had a rather nicer residence than somebody of a lower rank. And you see uh, D&E houses on the left and trailers on the right. And here's uh, another, another part of Richland. And then on the right-hand side are what are called hutments, which were tiny square prefab buildings. We'll, we'll get at those in uh, detail in, in a couple of minutes. But th this also emerged literally overnight, housing for tens of thousands of people, many of whom were brought in from other parts of the country in order to provide the labor force for, for the uh, uh, several sites. The one on the right is a, what's called a flat top, and uh, um, Ken, this is this is yours on, on the left-hand picture here. If you go to AMSI in Oak Ridge, there is a flat top that, that is accessible, and uh, one can go very nicely see what, this is a pretty, this is a pretty mid-level housing, uh, what, what, what it was like. And then security, there were gates. Every gate had, an, had a station, you were checked, you had to have your identification, your car was inspected. Whether you were going to Los Alamos, Hanford, or Oak Ridge, uh, if, you, if you were based, if you lived off the base, off the site, you had to go through these gates. If you went off site to do any kind of activities, you had to go through these gates. And it was a very, very careful security situation. Uh, some of the gates are still there. This is on the Oak Ridge Turnpike. And in fact, I recall when I was doing some of my research there, uh, this is now a meeting room. And really a, a rather nice little meeting room. And it's got lots of parking. <laughs> well, and everybody was subjected to security. Uh, here we see a youngster on the right side having his badge checked. And on the left, uh, Santa coming in for an event on, on site, uh, having, having his uh, presence inspect, inspected. And throughout, these absolutely fantastic security reminders. And how many of these have we, have we kind of worked their way into the, the legends of, of, the, of the secret cities and, and, and then on into the Cold War? And, and all of the sites were, were littered with these billboards that were very carefully reminding the workers constantly that what they were doing was absolutely vital to the war effort, and it was their requirement that they not talk to anybody about what they were doing, including the people they were working with, including the person at the workstation next to them, including their families. And uh, going, going through, uh, well, actually, I should st stop here and say that, uh, many of these photographs were, were taken by Ed Westcott. Uh, and there are, I'll, I'll show you some, some resources at the end of this. There are some magnificent things online that we can use for this exhibit that talk about daily life in the secret cities that are, are really, really very dramatic and very, very effective. And Westcott is responsible for that. Now, daily life involved the work sites on one hand. And here we're seeing two of them, the Y-12 calutrons and then a cl the classic picture of the, the changing of the shifts. And you'll notice that, that uh, pretty much everybody in both of these pictures is women. There's a, a, a bit of a stereotyping of the work that women did uh, in the secret cities. There were not just clerks and, and mechanical people, but there were, were women at all levels, scientific levels as well as technical and engineering levels. And they, they, were, they were a vital part of the workforce. Uh, at, at, at the entire project, and particularly uh, these, these places on, on, on Oak Ridge. But there's another aspect of life as well, and that's you got to have places for your kids to play. we got to get back and forth from the housing neighborhood that we live in to the plant that we're assigned to. So there's a very elaborate bus system, both on, on the sites and bringing people in from residential areas off-site. Well, everybody had to have lunch. On the left is a cafeteria. On the right is the local market. And, well, gosh, look, an A&P. We were really progressive in those <laughs> days. But uh, also you had to get gas for your car. So you had to do all of these things that had to do with everyday life. And there were schools. And here we're seeing the basketball team and the cheerleaders in Oak Ridge. Uh, so there were all of these aspects of, of civic life that had to be constructed, maintained, and kept secret for the duration. Uh, there was a very well-developed library system, including mobile libraries. And on the right-hand side is, is the orchestra. 
So people had ways of entertaining themselves, of providing leisure time activities on site for their colleagues. And I rather like uh, this pair of pictures. Uh, the, the chapel on the hill on the right was uh, one of the centers of, of religious activity. And on the left is the, uh, well, remember this is a dry state, but you look at what's on the shelves of that store. And there were, there were certain liberties that were taken if you happened to be on site, meaning you could get all the booze you wanted. Um, here's the hutment, uh, outside on the left, uh, inside on the right. There's an, another another stereotyped story here, in that that the the African American employees of in, on the secret cities were relegated to the most lower level housing. It was frequently the case, but certainly not entirely the case. And there were African Americans at all levels of employment uh, on the sites. So that I think as we look at the secret city story that we want to tell as a part of this exhibit, we've got to be careful that we look at the social structures and and the uh, organization of the Manhattan Project as a business, if you will, and how women and minorities played multiple roles and were not, not restricted to the, the very, very lower levels of, the, of employment and, and, and housing. Well, at the end, finally, and we've here been hearing a lot about those, those significant days, we found out what we were doing. We found out that we actually did build the bomb and the war was going to end. But for that duration of, of, the, um, of the development of the, of the uh, um, pr development and production of the facilities and the, the equipment, this was not known exactly how we were going to wind up. But great celebration, as you might imagine, when, when this was revealed. The, the aftermath, the Secret City finally opened and the public was invited in. Uh, the laboratory, national laboratory system evolved from those plants that we showed, like K25, and there is now looking at the uh, DOE's cleanup and reconfiguration of the sites. And something that, that I, I found as I was doing my work at Oak Ridge was I looked at the, the uh, period from 42 to 45 as the beginning of the Manhattan Project, and the Manhattan Project is still very active. The technological and scientific results of the Manhattan Project affect us in so many ways every day of our lives. Here's a celebration in 1949 of the formal opening of the secret city. Oak Ridge National Laboratories became the, the uh, uh, linchpin of the National Laboratory System, which is now all over the country. And the, we can, I, I'm sorry, this, this is not readable from a dis distance, but you see that the, the uh, spread of the National Laboratory Systems and the influence that they have had on 20, late 20th and 21st century science and technology. And then what is happening with, with the facilities, this is K25 a while ago, it's not there anymore. Uh, and unfortunately, the ability to do on-site interpretation in this absolutely incredible facility is totally lost for the future. And, and we tried very hard to convince the Department of Energy that uh, this was a national asset. Uh, and um, we just recognize Larry Lee here on the Park Service who wrote a magnificent 25-page paper urging the Department of Energy not to tear it down. I still have I, some faint the hopes. Hi there. Uh, <laughs> I still have some faint hopes that what's called the tech end, which was the very tail end, southeast end of the building, which is still there because of some technetium-99 right. radiation contamination, I still have some long shot hopes that we may be able to retain an aisle of it. Uh, yeah. It doesn't have the operating floor problem that the North Tower did, uh, where a right. guy fell through it. That's right there. Uh, because of some other things that were, yeah, some other things that were, were done, uh, the experiments that ended up with all the tech-99 contamination, put in a new floor up there. But that's not part of the historic fabric, so it's not a big problem. So we still hold out some hopes. So uh, write your friendly uh, DOE secretary and congressman and tell them that uh, all of it doesn't need to go away. Yeah. Oh, okay, and then um, there, there's some, some absolutely terrific resources about the, the, the secret city, some, some produced by people here. Uh, 
but uh, we're, we're going to, uh, Alex, we're, we're going to make this, this list available. And then uh, toward the end here, we see what's going on with the, uh, the uh, files that are produced by the Manhattan Project Heritage Preservation Association, the photography of Ed Westcott, which is accessible through the AMSI website, and then the voices of the Manhattan Project, which are the Atomic Heritage Foundation's uh, very, very interesting uh, initiative to do to first-person interviews of um, Manhattan Project veterans. And there, there are some absolutely stunning conversations that are taking place there. Cooperation with Los Alamos Historical Society. Okay, okay. Alex is doing all the work. <laughs> okay, but the, but the point the point I'm making is for for the, for this exhibit, we've got some some excellent resources for helping visitors to the to the exhibit understand the nature of the secret city and the and the lives of the people who work on the project, the families of those workers, and the challenges that they faced and the way, the very creative ways in which they addressed those challenges. And that's it, I think. Nope, one last thing, just uh, for, for the purposes of looking at current approaches to the Manhattan Project, we do have these uh, several different uh, existing museums, several of them on site or adjacent to the sites. Uh, that we can uh, use, several represented here at this meeting, uh, that we can use as resources as well as potentially as test sites for some, some of the activities or some of the, some of the programming that could become a part of, of this uh, uh, new exhibition. Now I'm done. <laughs>